Hey friends, hope the morning's treating you well. Hope you got your coffee. I got my coffee. You can see my buddy Teeny back here eating some sunflower seeds. Been nursing her back to health and she's looking a little bit better. But uh, I, I might talk about that in a little bit, but I wanna talk about uh, Elvis Costello and John Prine. I completely miss this. I've been off of Facebook for quite a while now and um, when John Prine passed away, Elvis Costello wrote something really, really nice, like a really nice uh, thing, and he put it on his Facebook page. So I didn't see it. Maybe, I'm sure a lot of you guys saw it, but I didn't see it. It's completely new to me. I've said this before, but one of my favorite things about doing this channel is the John Prine fans. I told some John Prine stories in the past, like when I first started doing a channel and all of these really, really nice people just came out of the woodwork. And um, there's so much positivity and I think that reflects on Prime, I really do. But, um, so with that in mind, I wanna share this thing I saw. Elvis Costello posted this on his Facebook page on April 13th, 2020. This is Elvis Costello. It says, I was speaking today to my pal and best man, the playwright Alan Bleasdale, about the sad passing of John Prine. We recalled that 40 years ago, when we were first introduced, the condition of us becoming friends was that the other also loved John Prine. This was non-negotiable, although neither of us needed to negotiate about it. Alan told me that if he had been a songwriter instead of a playwright, he would have wanted to be John Prine. I told Alan that when I was 19 and only pretending to be a songwriter, I too wanted to be John Prine. I think that's absolutely beautiful that Elvis Costello, as a young man, loved John Prine. And uh, I mean, Elvis has his own thing that he does and does really well. He's a great songwriter and performer himself, but I love that that he was into Prine at an early age. He says, now it is well known that John worked as a mailman before breaking into music. In terms of matching his rare and unique gifts, I might as well have grabbed my sack of letters and hit the pavement as uh, imagined that I could write like John. Alan told me he first heard John when he was teaching on what was then called the Gilbert and Elise Islands. How he managed to do so on a small atoll in Micronesia is something that is lost to the mysteries of broadcasting history. My own introduction was via an Atlantic record single plucked out of a discount bin of 45 RPM records on the counter of Rushworth and Dreeper in Liverpool. Any of my English friends ever been there? Uh, Rushworth and Dreeper in Liverpool? It was a copy of Sam Stone, backed by Illegal Smile, which in two short songs showed me everything that I would come to appreciate in John's writing. On the A side, a song of incredible empathy, an unflinching account of an addicted veteran and the impact of his torment on his family, all written with the authority of a man who had served in the army, while the B side was a good humored celebration of, of forbidden pleasures a good-humored celebration of forbidden pleasures. These two sides of John Prine's writing and the characters in his songs put me in mind of another great favorite of mine, Randy Newman. While Randy Newman's songs were often portraits of grotesque, rendered with the smallest but essential sliver of sympathy, Prine reached into similar darkness to pull out elusive light. While Randy Newman's complex harmony and piano compositions were nearly impossible to imitate on the guitar, a songwriting novice could mistake John Prine's use of simple guitar accompaniment for something what one might replicate. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, this is a good place to jump in. I should have asked you right off the bat, but um, do you, what's your favorite Elvis Costello stuff? And, um, and then tell me your favorite Prine stuff. I should have asked that right off the bat, but um, I'll keep going. Elvis says, if John Prine had only written his initial self-titled album, his place among America's great songwriters would be secured. In addition to Sam Stone and Illegal Smile, one might add Donald and Lydia, Hello in There, and Paradise, unique portraits of awkward lovers, shut-ins, older people, or those crushed by the wheel of industry. 
These were songs that no one else was writing, filled with details that only Prine's eye or ear caught. The arcane radio, the damaged and the des destitute. The songs were filled with what sounded like sound advice from a friend in a crowded bar or a voice in the margins, but never one that was self-pitying or self-regarding. He mentions Donald and Lydia here. So Donald, Donald and Lydia is one of my all-time favorite Prine songs, and it's a, one that gets forgotten and not mentioned that much. But man, that whole perspective of that song, of those two people thinking about each other, and not getting together um, is such a unique perspective and a beautiful thing. And I don't know, it's, and it's just what Pr Prine always did. So it's just a great song. But um, both Hol Hello in there and Angel from Montgomery traveled across musical styles to become pop hits for other artists at a time when unique songwriting voices ranging from Prine to Jimmy Webb to Randy Newman all enjoyed a broader audience for their songs that would be hard to imagine just a few years later. Every John Prine album since has delivered songs to his repertoire that no one else could possibly have written. Sabu visits the Twin Cities alone, Unwed Fathers, Let's Talk Dirty in Hawaiian, being just three utterly contrasting titles displaying a talent more akin to a 1930s short story writer or humorist than a folk singer. So I'll skip down a little bit here. It says, uh, a long while ago, I stumbled through a door in Wisconsin between two adjoining theaters, the one in which I was due to play the next night and the one in which John and his band were already in full flight. In my dreams of the show, there was a brass band playing and maybe an accordion, or perhaps John simply summoned them up with his words. I remember he danced a little, very joyfully, and that surprised me as I remembered the way I imagined him when I first listened to his records. Um, perhaps he too was hunched over a guitar, trying to puzzle out how to pull beauty from so few chords, or in need of an audience that allowed for the hushed dynamic of the songs. It was a wonderful surprise that he could also be a, the charming showman, possessed of some surprisingly nimble footwork. That was the confirmation of an important lesson. So when he t talks about Prine dancing on stage, there's a story that um, Todd Snyder tells about um, the last time he saw Prine, and um, he was dancing off the stage to, to Lake Marie at the end of the, the set, and, um, and he's really hamming it up with the finger points. Todd tells the story beautifully, and I don't want to steal his story, but um, you know, he's giving like the finger guns and stuff like that, and just hamming it up and having a really good time. But he just, Todd describes the audience, how the audience is just cheering and cheering, and it's not uh, laughing and cheering, and it's not so much that it's applause, but they're treating him like he just won the big game. You know, like Prine just won the big game through the big touchdown pass and uh, hit the home run, and we all won. And it's such a beautiful way to think about that. And Todd paints such a wonderful picture around it. And you guys, it's worth looking up. If there's, there's probably something on YouTube out there of Todd telling that story. I recommend that you see it, but I'll continue here. I had put aside the quiet songs that I had written in imitation of John Prine in order to raise and find my own voice. His gift was to be able to sit an audience to the scale of his song, the painful tenderness to which he could sing any one of his earliest songs as if they were brand new and then follow up with a new song, say Jesus the Missing Years or any of the tunes from Fair and Square or his latest top five hit album, The Tree of Forgiveness. Songs that were equal in quality even when different in scale and ambition. It's odd how it's odd now to recall that John Prine critics once penned a sign on John that had plagued anyone with an unusual vocal delivery and away with words from Donovan and Arlo Guthrie before him to Loudon Wainwright III and Bruce Springsteen after him. John Prine was supposedly the new Dylan, as if there was anything remotely malfunctioning about the old one. 
can hear the cops coming for me. I can tell when somebody's talking about prying, addressing the nation. Uh, it is odd to regard comparison at this distance. I think it is unlikely that Bob Dylan could have written Hello in there, as it would be that John could have written Masters of War, but they both had voices of the country, its experience and the price it paid. There is sometimes a Western gunfighter to be found in, Bob, in a Bob Dylan lyric, the killer line delivered with the flourish of a revolver spun back, spun back into the holster. The songs can be grave, almost apocalyptic, tender then sly, upsetting and then funny. Brian's lyrics seem only to overlap in these last three properties. There's a tight focus to the portraiture, but with humility and a humanity that is his own. I feel each songwriter would have surely admired the other and have said so. There is no new or better. These are estimations made by people who will never write a song. I'm going to pause for a second and let that one sink in. Elvis Costello says there is no new or better. These are estimations made by people who will never write a song. That's freaking great. And it's dead on. I think it's dead on. In September 2009, John was one of three songwriters featured on the television show Spectacle, of which I was a presenter and co-writer. By this time, we had established a method by which I would sing a few songs to welcome the audience to the, to the theme of the evening with hope that one of them might serve as the musical introduction to the edited broadcast. I hope, have you guys seen that? I think I saw something back back when on YouTube, but I I don't have like broad memories of it. Maybe you guys do. Uh, I opened that taping with Poison Moon and Wave a White Flag. Two of the songs that I told the audience were written when the height of my ambition was to be able to write with the economy an unusual subject matter of a John Prine song. One was a fantastic, or one was a fatalistic tune about finding hope in the night sky that could not be sensed on the earth, and another uh, l little ragtime trick, framing a tale of violent love. Neither song, neither song made it onto my first record, and neither song made it into the final show, but I'd felt better about telling the Apollo audience how much John's example had meant to me, even if the musical results didn't amount to much. John was the first interview subject prefacing our conversation with a stupefying performance of his epic song, Lake Marie. Truthfully, I could have talked to John all evening about the implica implications and the writing of this one incredible panoramic song, but of course, much of our conversation had to be put aside by the editor in order to accommodate the other guests. It'd be cool to find out that all of that stuff is still somewhere in a vault and they would just put it up on YouTube. Like just a, a director's cut, you know, if they have an hour's worth of interview between Elvis Costello and Prine that went, ended up getting cut down to being eight minutes, it'd be really cool to see them post some version of the long form in case anybody's watching. It would be fun. And, um... Perhaps some future archivist may stumble upon the f footage years from now and recognize it to be a chat between one of the great songwriters of the 20th and 21st century talking to a man in glasses with a clipboard. I guess Elvis Costello agrees with me. Uh, I got the squirrels coming up to me here. You see, we got a couple back here. What you doing now? After fine performances and conversations with Lyle Lovett and Ray Lemon Tang, the natural order of things was restored as the quartet of singers performed the Towns Van Zant song, Loretta, with Lyle and Ray taking the first two verses and John and I harmonizing on the third, before we all supported John on a rendition of Angel from Montgomery, which closed the show. Prime songs sometimes seem like a frayed root map of the emotions and speaking of the distance between two hearts or two realities. They don't point any fingers. They let you make up your own mind. 
When I consider the moment in which I am writing, I wish we could hear the song John might have written about an exhausted nurse quarantined in her own attic away from her three frightened children, or an ode to the fruit picker who puts the strawberry on her Sunday tart, or the delivery driver or shelf filler who makes sure there is food to purchase for someone to put on the family table, because these seem like scenarios or portraits that might be found in this catalog. People are quick to tell songwriters to lampoon hucksterism or even sing its praises. Someone will want their favorite songwriter to loudly sound the alarm or ridicule the morbid 24-hour industry of panic. I find it hard to imagine John Prine would have stooped to write such songs in any crude or obvious way. It is perhaps easier to imagine John writing about the child or wife sheltering from a father or husband's rage of frustration due to confinement or addiction, as these feel like characters both found in this hour of trial and within John's existing songs from This I Take Comfort. John Prine never needed to get on a soapbox to write and speak and song about the inequities, cruelties, and the loneliness of life. I think it was more in the spirit of hope that John joined Emmylou Harris, Nancy Griffith, Steve Earle, and myself on a concert for a landmine-free world, organized with the help of veteran and activist Bobby Mueller, Bobby Mueller in 20, 2002. The tour that opened in Belfast and closed in Oslo was just five shows long, but featured all the artists sharing the stage at once and singing in turn. Sometimes Emmy and I would harmonize on a tune of mine or a number by Felice and Boulot Bryant. Nancy Griffith might sing John's The Speed of the Sound, Speed of the Sound of Loneliness, while John himself sang different songs from his catalog every night, always casting a spell to which the others would have to respond. There was never a heavy hand to the way his voice or his songs connected to the objective of the tour. It was all understood. I'm going to get some coffee real quick here. Take a drink of coffee. Wet my whistle. By the end of the run, Steve Earle was permitting me to play a guitar counterpoint on Fort Worth Blues, and I had enlisted the entire company to sing the refrain of God's comic with gallows humor. Each show ended with John Prine singing Paradise, as well it might. After the show at the Hammersmith Apollo, I greeted my mother and friend as they came backstage. Turning around to see John standing on the stairs, I introduced him to my ma and then said, John, this is my best pal and your biggest fan, Alan Bleasdale. And a circle of friendship and song was closed. In 2016, John Prine, Tom Waits, and Kathleen Brennan were awarded the Penn New England Award for Lyrical Excellence, one of, the, one of a series of overdue acknowledgments that came to John in recent years. Where the hell was this gig? How did I not know about... I must be living underneath a rock. So there was some event where Prine and Tom Waits were there, with Elvis, and Elvis Costello. This is where it kind of comes to a close here. Uh, perhaps it was his resilience that makes accepting John's passing more difficult. He had repeatedly shown such strength and courage in overcoming the challenges of illness. He was so loved by Fiona and his family and all of his friends, admirers, and listeners that it was easy to believe that he would be returned to us to laugh as he read all of those many questions from his lyrics that acquaintances, strangers, and his longest-lived pals have been sharing in these last days. They tell us that the world with John Prine in it has been much better than the poorer one in which we now dwell. I'm grateful to Fiona Prine for the welcome she extended to the writer Tom Piazza, songwriter Joe Henry, and myself when we spent an irreplaceable evening with her and John last December. It was a delightful supper of laughter and stories with songs cited and memories marked, closing only as the glass of a slowly smoldering vintage jukebox filled with smoke and John had to disconnect it and crack open a window, breaking the spell into a gentle good night. If that sounds like something John might have made up, then I guess I may have finally learned my lesson. That's Elvis Costello talking about John Prine on his Facebook page 
right after Prine passed away. I had somehow completely missed that. I want to say this while there's some John Prine fans watching this. Um, in the spirit of turning people on to things that I think are truly great that you might not know about, but if you like John Prine, I think you will like this. There's a guy named Adam Carroll. He's a friend of mine, and um, he played in someone's backyard on a farm up in Cicero, Indiana, a couple nights ago. And um, Adam lives in Wimberley, Texas with his wife, Chris, and he's just a great, great songwriter. And um, I went and saw him a couple nights ago, and it was really great to see him. I hadn't seen him in maybe five years. I really dig Adam. I wish he was my neighbor. He's one of just a really quiet, calm, uh, decent human being. And um, but his songs have been recorded. Oh man. I know Hayes Carl's recorded a couple of his songs, um, Slade Cleaves, Robert Earl Keen. And um, if I was trying to tell you guys something to listen to, I always think of what I, when I try to turn somebody on to an artist, I think of what initially knocked my socks off. And sometimes that was a long time ago. So they released a lot of stuff then. And I like a lot of stuff since then. But I want people to, to feel what I felt when I first discovered their music. So I you know, will try to tell people that. So what, threw, what really knocked my socks off was a song called Errol's Song. And um, there's an album called Looking Out the Screen Door. Man, this is, might be 20 years ago when, uh, when I first met Adam. I'm not sure how long ago it was, but it's really, really great. Errol's Song. Girl with the Dirty Hair, um, Rice Birds, oh, beautiful song, beautiful. And um, if you dig the Robert Earl Keane, John Prine, you know, a guy who can finger pick and tell a great story. Um, they, they, I remember seeing, when I first met Adam, I was playing a festival in Colorado and um, Tim Easton, was there also. We were supposed to do a songwriter's round. It's like, I haven't done songwriter's rounds in years. I stopped way back when, but this was a particularly good one. And um, I didn't know Adam. I'd never heard of him. We just knew, oh, some guy from Texas named Adam Carroll. And um, I played a song, feeling pretty good about myself. Tim played a song, you know, it was really good, feeling good about himself. And then Adam played Errol's song, and we were just kind of like, oh, wow, this guy's good. <laughs> we wouldn't know anything about him at all, and we're just sitting next to him as he plays this song that just completely knocked our socks off. We're like, wow, and he's a real quiet guy. He just wasn't saying anything, just real polite and quiet. We're kind of like, oh, okay. And then like one song after another, was like that and uh, I don't know man there's people out there with big powered publicists you know with labels and teams behind them who are able to push you know their songs and their catalog out there and all of that and uh, and make some things happen and a lot of times most of the time it's pretty mediocre stuff you know and then there's like the real underground there's people like Adam who's just making great great songs, you know, writing great songs. It has a, a catalog of that. And one day when Adam's not around, I think that people will discover his catalog and they will treat him like they treat Blaze Foley, you know, or Towns or somebody like that. I think there's a good possibility of that. Wouldn't it be a lot cooler if we treated him like that while he's still around to enjoy it? So. I don't know. I just want to urge everybody watching this to give Adam's music a try. I will do everything I can to post a couple links down in the comments um, that, of songs that I think you might like the first time you hear it. And it'll give you an idea of uh, what's going on with Adam and him. Maybe if you guys all add him to your Spotify playlist alongside Towns and Blaze and Robert Earl Keane and 
stuff like that, maybe um, a lot more people, maybe Spotify will get the idea and start suggesting the stuff to a lot more people that dig those other artists. But um, didn't get a chance to record anything with Adam. We just didn't have any time. They were kind of on this crazy tour. I had a lot of other things going, so I only got to be around him for a couple hours that night. And, uh, get to watch him, listen to him play music. It's a beautiful setting. There were fields. The farmer who plows the fields were right there, but as far as you could see, kind of a north central Indiana. Um, as the sun was going down, sunset, just a beautiful setting. And some people out there in the backyard who love music and some great music from Texas. What's not to like? Beautiful Indiana night, a great songwriter from Texas. But I get hip to Adam Carroll, man. And um, if you already dig him, tell people down below that you dig him and tell them, point them towards something that they might dig, and I'll do the same thing. But um, I'm going to finish up my coffee and get out of here. Um, watch this video right here of uh, Lang Martin, the complete interview with a lot of stuff that was unpublished as before. So uh, watch this and enjoy it and I'll see you somewhere down the road. Much love to y'all.